Hello, Motor Rider World fans, and welcome to this episode of Talking Motor GP with myself, Rob Portman, and Paul Scott, where we're going to be talking everything from what was another very, very, very exciting Motor GP race weekend uh, at Portimao. Paul, um, again, Motor GP just did not disappoint. 41% uh, up in attendance was the Portimao Grand Prix. So, again, you know, we have all these murmurings of MotoGP and they're doing this wrong and aero and this and they're doing this wrong. Seems to be working because they, they, they've got us right where they want us. Even us, when we think we want to boycott, they, you know, and we want to throw our arms up. MotoGP's got this entertainment that we just can't get enough of. No, evening, everyone. How's it, Rob? You're lucky to be on the show again. I actually saw um, on the broadcast, I'm sure sure everyone who watched on Sunday saw, 174,000 over the weekend. That's huge. In 2012, myself and James Dent went to watch Chase Racing Superbikes. I don't think there were 74,000 people over the whole weekend. Okay. So to see that, because I understand, and I don't know if you've been to Portima, it's a little bit out of the way. Eh? It's not the easiest place to get to. The, you know, around it is lots of holiday accommodation, but it's not near Lisbon. It's a long way from a big city from what I can remember. So mm -hmm. I was very glad to see that. So, yeah, what you're saying is spot on. And I can tell you, my son-in-law watched with us on Sunday, and he's a big F1 guy um, for his sins. And he even said, mm -hmm. yes, as exciting as this. So, mm -hmm. and let's be quite honest, it wasn't the best race we've ever seen. But, I mean, there were lots of intricacies, and maybe for him, watching with someone like me who I can say to him, oh, check there and check there. But he thoroughly enjoyed it, and I think we've converted one more. I can tell you, I was at the Portimo um, race last year. And remember, it, last year it was the first round of the first. championship because Qatar yeah. wasn't there. And it was a good vibe, good atmosphere. You know, obviously, Portugal, you know, football's number one, and motorsport is very much number two because of Miguel Oliveira. Um, the whole team at Portimo have always done a great job it's it's a track that's very accessible to the world of motorcycles and cars we see the guys testing there a lot and so they, they've done well to make themselves very accessible and i think that's brought in let's start bringing in the excitement uh of, of motor gp i think portimao is definitely one of the more fan accommodating um ones that i've been to within the european network and they just amplified it again this year unfortunately i wasn't there but we did have a couple of insiders there for us uh, on behalf of Motor Rider World who we'll bring in just now. But yeah, a big hat off to, to Portimo and everyone involved in Portugal because it was fantastic. To see that atmosphere there, it, it was electrifying. You could feel it come through the TV. And like I said, as much as we sometimes get our backs up with MotoGP and this and that and this, they've got a product that we just cannot get enough of. And it's just on the rise. There's more and more fans contacting me for passes to get to races. How do we do this? How do this? So, the MotoGP product is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and and from weekends like this, as you said, when you've got someone sitting and watching it for the first time, it can only draw you in because there's, there's just so many, you know, when just when you think it's getting boring and that race, I was starting to like, starting to doze off. Next minute, Marquez, Benyaya, Vinales, you know, Acosta. And you, you're just, as soon as you doze off, you're kicked in the face and said, no, 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 no. We want your attention. So, well done to everyone uh, involved this weekend. Let's jump straight into it because I've got to go shout at some some uh, very excited British footballers uh, a little bit later. So uh, that's why we had to move this to Monday night. So thank you to everyone for tuning in. I'll be on the road uh, to Ireland for the next three days. That's why we had to do it now. So Luca Jefferson, uh, Sean Powell, uh, everyone is tuning in. So remember, get those... Um, get those uh, questions in. Luca Jefferson, yes, the share show was at Portimao. He was one of our insiders along with Paul Pacheco. So let's go through it. Uh, Paul, before the race weekend even started, a bit of big news. Furman Aldeguer confirmed to be going uh, to Ducati next year. MotoGP confirmed that he'll be in the Pramac team. That's obviously opened up a whole can of worms. Martin saying, unless I get a factory ride, I'm going where there's a factory ride. Martin has made it clear, I am going where there's a factory ride. I would like it to be a red Ducati. If it's not a red Ducati, I'll go elsewhere. Now, and everyone can have their say here. I'd like to hear your say. My quick say on it before we jump into the rest of it is that there's three different scenarios I can see playing out here. I can see Martin jumping in the factory Ducati team, Bastianini either going Pramac or potentially to Aprilia that's now been talked about. 
Um, the second scenario I can see is Ducati saying, okay, is it? And we know Ducati have got big heads when it comes to their bike. So our bike made you the rider, not the other way around. And Ducati saying, okay, well, Martin, you know what? Good luck. Go somewhere else and see how you do at a Honda or a Yamaha that's being mentioned or a Prilia. You go see. We've got, you know, Furman Aldegare coming. We've got uh, Peko Banyaya. And we've got this massive wild card that could potentially be in our red colors in, in Mark Marquez. Now, I thought about that even more. And I could see Ducati and Gigi Alinea, De, De Linea, I could see that the cocks turning in their head going right. We've extracted pretty much all the information we need from Jorge Martin. We've got all the information, his riding style, you know, we've developed the bike. Now we've got a Mark Marquez, you know. So, okay, Martin, you want to, you know, put the pressure on us and tell us you're going to be a factory rider. Okay, you go. We'll take Mark Marquez and add even more information to this bike. You know, you go to Yamaha and Honda that are that are still a year, two years maybe away from being where we are. You go do that. We'll take Mark Marquez, Furman Aldegate, just all these all these different personalities and minds and riding styles and create an even better package. So there, there's so many ways to look at, at, at this. For me personally, right now as it stands, I don't know how you feel and everyone else feels here. I don't think we'll be seeing Jorge Martin on a Ducati next season. I don't know what you think. I, I'm going to agree on that statement 99%. Okay. The only thing I think that will change the fact that he'll end up on Bastianini's bike is if he wins, which won't happen, but if he wins every race from now until the end of the season. Because then Ducati are going to say, listen, we've got to keep this guy. But remember, when they signed the contract with Peko end of last year, early this year, they said we're cutting back on our costs. Yes, yes they gave yeah. Peko a great contract. He's definitely their golden boy. Now, Martin, I presume he's on a reasonably good contract because they want exactly the same level. Now he wants to go to the factory bike and he's going to say, okay, I'll go on the factory bike, but I want what Peko's getting. And I think that's going to be the stumbling block. Ducati are going to say, we'll give you the bike, but we'll tell you what you're getting. And I think that's where he's going to say, no. So I think I'm in agreement with you. I don't think that he's going to be on the factory Ducati. It's making a statement that he's only going to go to a factory team. Well, look how that turned out for Luca Marini so far. And I'm not considering them the same level, not by any manner of means. But if you take Martin and stick him on a Yamaha or a Honda, as talented as he is, Ducati might have the upper hand by saying, but it's actually our bike that makes you look maybe 1% better than you actually are. Look, he's fantastic. I love him. I think he's, he's, he's as good as anyone there consistently, mentally, everything. But if he now jumps on... And I don't think he's got an option at KTM. There could be a maybe a 25% option at Aprilia. And obviously, we'll discuss that. But I think Quattararo's, that's a done deal. Mm -hmm. um, so what's he left with? Honda and Yamaha? Yes, I don't know. If he's, if he's been watching the races and he saw where Luca Marini was, well, all the Hondas. I mean, on the grid for the race, the last four bikes were the factory Hondas. You know, so me personally, I'd stick on a second rate, if you want to consider the Premac rider, second rate Ducati versus a top tier Honda or Yamaha right now. So yeah, I don't know, but I do agree with you. I don't think we're going to see him on the full factory Ducati. A couple of good comments. Oli Moto, Martin deserves a factory ride based on the start to the season so far, but he could miss out if Bastianini keeps improving. Marquez is a dark horse for it, kind of what we mentioned. Sven Grinner says, I don't think Marquez will, uh, they'll choose Marquez over Martin for that factory ride, but he can see Bastia staying and Martin ending up at Yamaha Honda. And what also makes my thought pattern go that way is Martin is arrogant enough and confident enough in himself to go, you know what, I'll show you. I'll climb on that Yamaha, that Honda, and I'll win. You know, he, he's that kind of personality, and, and it'll be great if he does. Listen, it'll just add even more flavor to this exciting dish that's MotoGP. A couple of Portuguese fans in here, thank you for joining us. And again, well done to, to everyone involved in Portugal for putting on a fantastic race. A couple of Portuguese Portuguese fans hoping Oliveira is going to make that jump somehow onto the Premac. Look, let's not forget, Franco Morbidelli's ride is not secure on that Premac. So, you know... the, the the first signing of 2025 has been made already. We know a lot of riders are out of contract. We know there's going to be a lot, a lot of musical chairs. I'm, a, I'm in agreement with you. I think Fabio Quattararo has already made his mind up. I think he'll definitely be one of the Aprilia riders. Uh, I think Bastianini could be this. What, what worries me about Bastianini is there's no hype 
made about Bastianini and that Ducati team. Uh, he was on pole position, but the story what line was still Mark on the second row, Pecco, how's he going to do, Martin. So Bastianini at this stage could go win a race, qualify pole, be the top Ducati, as he was for most of the weekend leading up to the racing. And, it, and it's still not highlighted. Ducati have done it in the past. They are very much, a, you know, they, they, there's a number one rider in our team. And it's, it's been in every team. We saw Lorenzo push Rossi out of Yamaha. You know, we've seen Ducati make a big call, a judgment call on Lorenzo. As soon as he was, he was building momentum, they made a decision on him at the start of the season and he was gone. So Ducati are very rash and 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 have had very bad management when it comes to, to rider dealings in the past. So that's why this doesn't surprise me. The obvious sign is for Martin to go the factory Ducati route. It's the obvious sign. But there's a lot to think about that. As you said, now you got Martin and Banya in the team. Who gets what? Who to yeah. manage that? Bastianini was a little bit more manageable because I think we all knew that Bastianini is great and he's going to win races, but he's never going to be, in my mind, and he, I hope he proves me wrong. And I, you know, I don't think he is, but he's never going to be that every weekend challenger to me. And I think Ducati, in a way, chose Bastianini at the time. He was getting better results than that, but I think he was easily or easier managed. Whereas Martin. Jesus, they'll have their hands full with Martin and Benyai in that team. And Rob, that's part of the problem that they've got. We don't know the behind-the-scenes dealings. Mm -hmm. But I think that's exactly the point. Bastianini is manageable. He's likable. He's, he's going to fit in with what their agenda is. Now they put Martin in that team and say to him, but you're number two to Pecco, he's going to be like, not a chance. You give me exactly what he gets, and I race him till the death. And I think that's going to be part of their problem. So I, I, I'm betwixt and between you. I don't think you'll be on the factory bike. They're going to keep Bastianini if his results are anything like this weekend. And you're quite right. He has a fantastic weekend. And he's like Nakagami. No one actually knew he was there. Yeah. You know, brilliant. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to get better and better. Let's hope he doesn't get injured. Um, I, I, I was very happy to see how well he rode this weekend. Consistent, fast. And they'll be happy to keep him in second fiddle. Me as Martin, if I'm not getting the factory ride, I want the Pramac ride there because it's the it's the factory ride in a different color, you know. And mm -hmm. I understand the the psyche that you want to be the number one and you want to be in a factory team, but he's not going to be number one at Ducati. We know that Pecco's already signed the contract, so what is the benefit to him except that he's on the full factory team unless they're going to make him promises? That are different to what they promised to Pecco, which I can't see happening. Um, but those are the behind the scenes things. Unfortunately, we'll never know. And and I think most rash people would agree and say there's no benefit to Ducati to move him to the factory team because it's going to upset Pecco's side of the garage. There's no doubt. So keep him where he is. He's doing well. He's got a great bike. His psyche. Remember going back two seasons ago when he didn't get the ride, when they gave it to Bastianini. He was very quick to have a wobbler, and I won't say bad mouth Ducati, but he certainly voiced his opinion that he didn't agree with their decision. Now, how's that going to sway? He didn't get the ride in the last year either. Okay, the ride wasn't up for grabs, but they didn't make a plan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Ducati might be thinking too, listen, he's quite a, he's a, he's a bit of that um, unmanageable child where if he mm -hmm. doesn't get his way, he has a wobbler. Now we put him in the team, but Peko's number one. What's he going to be like then? So it's a very it's it's a it's a thing. I wish we had a fly on the wall to tell us how they sort this out. But I, I can't see him. I, I think he's Pramac Ducati with Aldegaya. Or if he goes, then I don't know because I can't see Morbidelli keeping that right. Just my opinion. Not now that we know they've signed Aldegaya. Because if your choice is um, getting rid of Martin or Morbidelli at the end of the season, well, we know where your choice would have to be. So. Very difficult one for Martina. He's the one who's got a big decision to make. I like Sven Grinner's comment. Martin been hanging around with Alicia Spargro too much. Um, a lot of people with great comments on the side there. You know, we'll talk about Mark Marquez just now, but that's an intriguing factor with how well that he's done uh, already on the Ducati. Yes, we know what happened this weekend and we'll talk about it. But surely he's not going to be staying in the, th the third tier or the bottom tier Ducati smaller team. Surely there's going to be a step up if he stays with Ducati are they in Pramac uh, on a better bike, better package, better salary, or the or the factory team? So that that it's 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 all it, it's all kind of swirling up to be a very intriguing musical chairs kind of um, 
what's going to happen in 2025, but at least we know Thurman Aldegar is one piece in the puzzle so far. And, and you know, Rob, one thing I want to just throw in there while we're talking about it, and we're not discussing Mark yet, but Mark has shown a level of maturity jumping to Ducati that I don't think anybody expected. Mm -hmm. he's, he's taken it step by step. He hasn't jumped on the bike and said, I'm the eight times world champion, I'm going to blow you all away. He's kind of taken three steps back. Mm -hmm. And I think personally, and I'll be the first to admit, I love the guy. Mm -hmm. he, he's taken a step back and he said, I'm going to work myself into this round, almost as if he's got a, not even a two-year plan, maybe even a three-year plan. Mm -hmm. This year we learn the bike, next year we can challenge and then hopefully year three things go our way, if it doesn't in the next year or two. But he certainly hasn't shown the kind of any, which I don't think he really was that kind of guy, but he hasn't been outspoken and making a lot of noise and, oh, check my results already. He's been kind of low-key. Yes, he's been smiling. And yes, he said things are going well. But I, me personally, I think he's been very low-key when you consider what he's actually done. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's something Ducati are going to look at and say, listen, if that's his attitude, he's very mature. We can manage this oak. So why don't we move him instead of Martin? I'm not saying he's getting the factory right. Not by a long shot. I'll be very surprised if he did get it. Mm -hmm. But I think that's... He's shown a level of maturity that maybe in the last two seasons under pressure, Martin hasn't shown. Rui Balmonte, my good friend, uh, Por Preto, Rui Balmonte from uh, Portugal, who works for the um, Portimao track. Rui, fantastic job to you and the whole team, because I know half of Africa was blown onto that track on Thursday and Friday or Thursday night and Friday. Yeah, awesome and at, at, yeah, at one stage it was looking very doubtful, but they did a fantastic job. Another fantastic Grand Prix. Rui, team, keep up the great work there. Um, okay, let's quickly jump into, I'm just going to bang them through uh, as the overall results. We'll touch on each rider as we do in the past. Jorge made Martin, top of the pops in the main race. I was, you know, forgetting the, 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 the saga of where is he going. I was very impressed with Martin. He showed a bit more maturity this weekend and, and in Qatar, to be honest. There's no more of this. I'm going to push over the limits. If it's not there, it's not there. In the sprint race, you know, the Martin of last year, you could see him over committing because he's the sprint man and potentially crashing out or something. He kind of, I mean, none of these riders accept where they finish, especially if it's not on, on the top step of the podium. But he was a bit more relaxed. He In that sprint race, I got the feeling that between him and Banyaya, their first port of call every weekend is to beat each other. Absolutely. So Martin sitting there in that sprint race going, okay, I didn't win, but I've beaten Peko Banyaya, who was out front and looking like he was going to beat me. So job done there. I was a little bit worried, even though he was talking up a big Sunday. Martin, he was saying, we've got the pace. I'm good. I was like, geez, you know, sometimes when riders do that, they're trying to convince themselves and trying to put off other riders. And I thought... Geez, Martinez, you know, that sprint race was good. But if you're not dominating sprint races, you generally don't do much in the Sunday race. That Jorge Martin that came out on Sunday was, you, you, you're not going to beat that. You, you cannot beat that Jorge Martin. He got the launch. He got out front, did not put a, put from, a foot wrong. Very much like Peko Banyan Qatar. If Vinales closed two tenths, he went, okay, I'll open two tenths. He managed the situation to absolute perfection, uh, Jorge Martin. And uh, for that, I take my hat off to him. And for that, definitely, again, outside the transfer talk, on a race weekend, I see more of a title contender now. Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing more you can say. He did everything that was expected of him by his team, by his management, by his fans. He was just, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so he got lucky on, on in the sprint race with uh, Peko making a mistake. But luck counts, eh? But exactly what you say, Rob, he is certainly, he, he believes it's a two-horse race. It's him and Peko. And if he's got that mindset right now, I think he's going the right way as opposed to the Martino previously. Like you say, flat out in the sprint, annihilate everyone. You know, McDermott always said it, win by the slowest margin possible because you eliminate any chances of a Peko Bagnaya uh, sprint race mistake, you know. So, yeah, I think he had a fantastic weekend. And as you say, that's how it is. Very ominous, eh? Yeah, talking about Pekka Banyai, because obviously he didn't finish the Sunday main race. Um, it's one of those weekends where, you know, we always, at Qatar, you sing Banyai's praises. He's so mature. He never makes a mistake. He's able just to fix things. He's manageable. He's, he's just this perfect world champion. But 
these little mistakes always creep in and it's it's always his mistakes you know and he always comes out and that's where i take my head off to to pick he always comes out after the sprint race and says i effed up my fault nothing you know i, I threw it away um the incident with mark which we'll talk about um when we get to what well, we might as well talk about it now because that was probably the biggest other than acosta who we'll talk about just now the biggest accolade of of sunday's race so Pekka Banyaya has the incident with Mark Marquez and he comes out and he said, you know what? And I, and I think this is after an hour, two hour calm down period after his PR agent and that got to him and said, it was a racing incident. Um, no one to blame. You've got to kind of rectify it and look forward. But there are these little chinks in the armor of Pekka Banyaya. And we've seen it in, in years gone by, even in, in his, two, his last two years of winning the championship. We've seen these races where it looks all to be going well and then he just makes these little mistakes. And... I think the mistake on Saturday in 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 the if if Pecco had gone and won that race the way he looked like he was going to go win, I think we would have seen a different Pecco on Sunday. You know, something just put a little bit of doubt in his mind. They maybe, you know, when you have a moment like that, you go back and the bike was performing perfectly up until that moment. Then you go back and you start questioning things now. Instead of being this assertive, I know what I've got, now you start questioning things, and that just throws up a whole bunch of curveballs. And I think that came into play with Pecco on Sunday because he didn't look couple of people commenting down the side yeah, he didn't look as assured of himself with the package didn't look like they made the right decision whichever whichever way they went and that put him into that situation with with mark marquez who again like you said i think was riding the perfect race he didn't have the overall pace he was just hanging around there but he did have the pace to come late on and potentially challenge for a podium which he was doing now let's quickly do a brief overview of the incident because there's been a lot of talk. It's this and that's and this and that. I'm going to give my two cents. You can give your two cents. Everyone, please mention your comments on the side and we'll pick it apart. For me, 100% racing incident. It's a corner that we've seen that incident in World Superbikes, World Supersports, 600s, 300s, 400s, MotoGP, Moto2. It's that kind of corner that invites that. Now, I, I don't. I agree that there was no penalty given out. I 100% agree with that. But and this is where we're going to bring in the voice note that we got from Sheridan Marais, who was there. Sadly, couldn't join us now because he's traveling to Valencia to do some testing. Um, uh, the, the voice note that I sent you. She says, you know, on the bias of previous race direction decisions where penalties have been handed out, if you want that consistency that someone should have got a penalty, and that someone should have been Peko Panyaya, if you really dive into it and you really want to pick it apart, which we don't want to do. I'm happy there was no um, kind of um, penalties or anything. It was 100% a racing incident. And anyone who's raced a motorbike before will know that. Mark came a deep lunge into a corner that he knows is kind of, you can bring it back. Pecco went for a gap that he knew Mark was going to close. Mark knew that Pecco was going to go on the inside. Two alpha males, two going for the racing, two going for the podium. It's going to happen. But if someone is to blame and if race direction want to pin the blame on someone, I I believe Pecco is the one to blame. Sheridan in his voice note said Pecco is the one to blame because you know what move is coming from Mark Marquez. So that's just the general consensus. The, the, the fact that nothing was handed out and it was viewed as a racing incident for the first time in a long while, I think race direction have, have got it right in my mind. So I just want to go back to Saturday's sprint race. I think it was lap two. Martin Dive bombed Mark Marquez in that mm. corner. Bombed him, pushed him wide, got the gap, off he went. Mm. Mm. With a lap to go, Mark did the exact same move on Martin, passed yeah. him. And maybe ran a little bit wide because there was no incident. They didn't replay it six or seven times. Mm. So I can't really remember. But it's the same corner, it's the same move, different outcome. Now we get to him, he passes Pecco. It's a hard move, but it's a fair move. He runs a little bit wide. And I saw a photo today on Crash.net's website where you see marks a little bit wide. Not mm. much, but the gap for, for Pecco is just not there. So Pecco takes the gap, which if you remember, I think it was in, I can't remember, one of the races last year. We even commented, I think it was Australia. The guys ran a fraction wide and he dive bombed two oaks in one corner. But he got it right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Racing incident to Oaks. Look, Mark's comment afterwards was kind of like, Pekka, mm -hmm. we're racing for two points. You mm -hmm. know, where we would have got 15 and 13. Now we get zero. So I understand that. 
but still, and Mark said, I had a quicker pace, I was catching him. Oh, yeah. Just, but they, that's not how their minds work. None of them. So I think it was a pure racing incident. If you're going to apportion blame, like she said, more Pecco, but I think it's a 49, 51 yeah, exactly. percent. And exactly. we've got two, as you say, alpha males between the two of them, 11 world championships. You know, they they do race. They're not there to decide, oh, well, you go first, Sonny. So I think purely a racing incident, very disappointing, regardless of whether you're a Pecco or a Mark fan. Because if, you, if you're if you a fan of either of those two, it's now set them back a little bit in terms of the championship. But on the other side of the coin, kept Brad in his spot, opens the championship up, but they've got to be very careful because we, we've discussed this many times, Rob, the Ducati Oaks fighting amongst the Ducati Oaks. Now we've already seen it once, eh? and that's, that's two big names. I said after Qatar, those top four um, are going to be the top four in the championship. Suddenly it's changed. You know, mm -hmm. both of them are all, I think Bagnar is now fourth. Acosta's moved up a place. Mark's mm -hmm. moved down two places. Suddenly, the whole dynamic has changed. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you what, one, one I'm going to say it was a, no doubt a racing incident. But one incident like that, yes, we've got plenty cats amongst the pigeons here now. Eh? So Johnny Martins, don't agree with you, Rob. 93, you ran right and cut back um to try and pick the racing line so johnny i i as as paul says it's it's very much when when we say peco is at fault it's a 51 percent to 49 percent. but let me quickly explain the dynamic of that corner that corner is very much a you can go in and you can make it a v in racing terms so you can go scrub off the speed square it out which means there's a there's a sharp turn and you bring it back online and you square it out if it was a corner that had more of a you know a long ratio corner and you know Mark's running wide for a while and then Peko comes and then Mark brings it back down. It's a different story. But it's a corner. And, and, and if you look at Brad, you watch the onboards with Brad and Pedro Acosta. Pedro Acosta's line was to hug that corner, which some riders do. They go in on the brakes, keep it upright as much as possible and hug the curb on the inside. Or in Brad's case, whether it was forced or not because of the bad setup that he had, he would run in a bit deeper, square the cor corner off and bring it back. So he was leaving that probably the same amount of gap that Mark left for Pecco there. So it's that kind of corner that invites that kind of move. If I was Pecco in that incident, I would have taken that inside line. I, I see a gap. I'm going to take it. Knowing that Mark's going to come back. Of course, of course, Mark's not going to pass him and go, okay, I'll run wide. You take it. Mark's going to try and close that line all day long. So it's, and that's why it's called a racing incident. Pecco was... Well, I say that percent or two percent more in the wrong because he knew Mark was going to come barreling across him. He knew Mark had the better pace. You know, you, if you factor in those, but in that situation where you're making split, tick, you're not thinking of that. Pico's not thinking, okay, well, Mark's got the better pace than me. Uh, maybe I should back off. If you look at just the lap before that, where Pedro Acosta passes um, Pico Banyaya, goes Pico tries to find him back. Pedro cuts straight across him. Pecco's got to roll out. The commentators still say what Pecco did there was what he should have done at Lamar last year with the Vinales incident. There's some times where you've got to look, see the situation, and know what's going to play out, and you just got to roll out. And that situation, for me, Pecco with everything, right, I'm struggling, I don't have the pace. If it was a battle for the lead, different story. But as Mark says, you, you've thrown away, you didn't have the pace, your tires were falling off the, the edge of a cliff. You know, what, what did you have to gain by trying to pass him back? Mark would have lunged on the next corner or the next corner. So, but these are all things easy to say after the fact. In that moment, it was alpha male, F you, you're not overtaking me. Alpha male, F you, I'm overtaking you. Bang, story done. So I, I, I'm just happy that race, I was so worried that there was going to be a penalty because then I would have just lost my mind. The fact that there's no penalty, well done, brilliant, um, fantastic. Um. Let's let's close off on Mark Marquez. Everyone on the side's got their own comments. Also, a bit of a split. Some people saying it's Pickers' fault. Some saying Mark. Blah, blah. Some people saying fully agree. It's a it's a racing incident. So we'll leave it there. Let's quickly just touch on Mark Marquez because um, he wasn't in the results for me again. Fantastic weekend, as you said at the stop start of the show. Three steps back to to make one step forward. Gradually, gradually, gradually. He still got it right. He said I'm about fourth, fifth, or sixth. Qatar qualified sixth, finished fifth and fourth. That's where he is at the moment. Portimao made a step because he likes the track. He's always kind of gone fast there, struggled in one or two corners. But Shez did make a note 
in the voice note that he sent us, standing trackside and watching. He said, you know, when when Mark gets that Ducati sorted, he's going to be really hard to beat because at the moment he's, he's still playing around. And Shez, you know, I noticed it, and we spoke about it before we came on show. I, I noticed it on TV, but for Shez to notice a trackside, and I, Shez sent me a voice note, so we had no conversation. Shez sent me a voice note with bang, 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 these topics. And he said, Mark's biggest problem at the moment is his bike's slow. It's, it's visibly slower than the other bike. Now, whether that's because Mark has tamed down the power to kind of save tires or tamed down the power while he's still learning or his setup just doesn't um, translate to, you know, Mark's very front-end orientated, so the rear's not getting to the ground as much and accelerating him out the corners as much. But there's something where Mark Marcus's bike is not as fast as others and as the other Ducatis. And we saw, you know, Pedro Acosta be able to slipstream and pass him into turn one. Okay, he did the same with Benyaya, but he looked like he was a bit closer there but anyway the mark marquez ducati exercise i think is still very much on track yes it had a blip this weekend with three crashes ultimately which which is always going to happen with mark which is always going to happen with any of these riders brad had two crashes they're pushing the limit but again i was impressed with mark marquez after his second ride on a ducati to still be challenging in the sprint race the top ducati the top ducati in the sprint race in again that third or fourth tier ducati team and like Shez says, and a lot of people in the comments here and on Facebook everywhere say, once once he really gets fully confident and he makes that mental switch of right, no more three steps back, I'm com I'm confident enough now to attack. That's just another pawn on that chessboard that's looking to checkmate. And another, again, problem in the in the minds of Martin. You know, does how does Martin look at this now from the sprint race? And, you know, Jesus, Mark Marquez is here. He's here already. We weren't expecting this guy here now. You know, realistically, we were expecting Kota soon. And again, where are we going next? Yeah. Kota. Yeah. And this is what irritates me with the Mark Mark here. Well, I'm sure it irritates Mark as well. Had he just picked up those points now, after Kota, if everything goes well and it's a Mark Mark here's Texas rodeo like we know it's going to be, I mean, it's a the, the championship story is 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 painted a lot differently. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing to highlight as well, Rob, both the sprint and the main race, but specifically sprint, his starts were very good. He's aggressive, maybe assertive is a better way of saying it, in the first three or four corners. And then the rest of the lap, he still makes sure that he can get one or two guys. So by the end of the first lap, he'd gone from eight to fourth, eight to fourth. So he certainly understands the dynamic of where he needs to be. He, sure, he blundered in, in uh, Q2, which was 100% his fault. He admitted it, threw him off his game. So now he didn't have the time. He had to jump on his spare bike to qualify, qualified eighth. Not good at this level, and he knows that. But once again, that's why I'm saying we're seeing the mature mark. He's taking a step back, I think, and looking at the situation and saying, okay, I'm eight. My objective is to get by the end of lap one, probably fifth, if I can get to fifth. He got to fourth. Then he methodically works his way past people. Yeah, it looked to me a little bit in the main race like he lost a bit of pace, started rolling off the top four. Then suddenly he was back on it again. Um, I think he got a bit of a wake-up call when Pedro came past because it certainly looked like he was following Pedro Acosta. So, yeah, yeah. I, I th me personally, I think he's he's going about it as a long-term thing. Definitely not a – and I said I was hoping to see him win by uh, Mugello. Yeah, we'll see next week. Obviously, Kota or the next race. Kota is definitely his playground. But let's see, see how it goes there. But he certainly, things are working in this, the right way. W what you say about his bike, whether they've dialed out power, whether he's still adapting, because his bike definitely is not on par with the factory Ducatis or the Pramac bikes. He's making it, getting in the fight because of his talent. Um, but speed-wise, he's definitely lacking a little bit. But I can't believe it's a Ducati problem because all the other bikes are so fast. Um, it would be interesting to see, and I didn't look, what the top speed difference was between him and Alex. Just as a matter of interest. Is he way off? Is he close? Um, but yeah, so that's an interesting dynamic. I think he's he's just going to get faster and faster. But saying that, so are, you know, everyone's moving at the same pace, more or less, except for one guy who's jumped on the bike, ridden it for a few days, and he's just showing i mean i know the oak's talented but wow is pedro costa not lighting a flame under everyone's butts over this racing eh? yeah absolutely we're going to get there in a second to end off the mark comment you know he, 
it, it was no secret that at Honda, he set his Honda up very much front end orientated because he made yeah. up all his time on the brakes and that. So he's still adapting to that. I don't think the Ducati needs as much front end, you know, he could balance the bike out. So those are still things that, and, and again, that's what I think in the setup, you know, you put a little bit more weight on the back, it's going to drive and you're going to get more drive out of the corner. So there's still a lot, there's still a lot to do on that Ducati exercise. He's on Peko's bike from last year. So he's lucky he's got all that data. I would love to know, the difference between Peko set up at Portimao last year, the base settings that they gave Mark, and what Mark's setting was, just to see. Because even Simon Crafer was saying, every time he sees Mark, that front wheel's kind of extended outwards, so he's riding like a Harley yeah. type bike. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, to Mark's 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 riding style is 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 very different, and it's, he's still in that adaptation period. And a lot of people going with that same sentiment down the side. Yeah. Quick mention to Mart von Jarsfeld. Mart, I agree with you fully. Uh, 100% with Pekka. Pekka was also getting a bit frustrated with not catching the front guys. Then a rookie passed him. Then uh, the mark passed. And I believe as a racer took the chance, but overdid it. It, it was. It, it was a frustrating move. You know, it was a lunge from Mark. It was frustration from Pekka that I've got to defend it. And it, it happens in racing. I know a little big media co also doesn't uh, uh, kind of agree that Mark shouldn't be cutting back. But, it, you know, it, it is. It's, it's, it's the perfect... Um, scenario of a racing incident. Let's quickly yeah, get yeah. going here because I'm running out of time. I need to, to shoot out of here by quarter past mm -hmm. seven my time, which is quarter past nine your time. Bastianini in second. Again, we've touched, touched upon him. I think he he needs he needs momentum of three or four races, qualifying front row, winning races, podiums for all of us, including Ducati, to start going, okay, okay, this, this guy's here. At the moment, you're like, Bastianini, yeah, I love him. I love his style. I love his his attitude. I love the push like a bastard. Do I take him as seriously as I take Martin and, and Pecco and Brad? And no, I don't. Because of the interruption that he had last year, he's, he looks back on track, fingers crossed. He looks back on track. And um, yeah, he just needs a run of consistent results to put it and say, listen, guys, I'm here. I'm, I'm here. Don't count me out. But I always think he'll have that little bit behind and i think why well, i think mostly he'll keep that ducati ride is because i think he's a lot more manageable i think ducati can have their thumb on him and say listen you're number two and and in some ways he's a bit more okay with that than, than a martin would be if you know what i mean yeah absolutely and maybe he's more comfortable in that position than if we go back not last year the year before with jack miller in that position where jack mm -hmm. like we've mentioned and i, I still agree 100 percent with you Every season, Jack seems to have his ride is under threat. He's, he's got to perform. Where Bastianini seems to say, well, I'm quite happy to be number two. I'm going to win some races. I'm going to qualify on pole. I'm going to finish second. Those are the results you expect from me. I'll deliver. And they can manage Pekka as their golden boy. I, I think that's exactly how they want their team to run because they're not upsetting their golden boy. I still believe you put Martin in there. And we've got, we've got a Rossi uh, Lorenzo deal from Yamaha 12 years ago. There's going to be walls down the middle. There's going to be hell to pay. I believe that if we've got Martin and Bagnaia in the same team. We're with Bastianini. And I hope, like heck, that he starts winning and he moves himself and he, he becomes a player because he certainly has the ability. But um, I, I think you're right, Rob. They, they can manage him. He seems to come across as that kind of guy that he's mm. quite happy to fulfill the role. He's a factory Ducati rider. He's got a contract. He's getting the results that they expect of him. And what mm. more does he have to do? So I, I think he's he, he just needs exactly what you say, four or five, three or four even races where he's consistently top three or four. And that'll really bring the spotlight back onto him. Right, let's move on to the big talking point then you mentioned him, Pedro Costa. Let's 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 bang through this quickly. So Pedro Costa, what impressed me? I mean, Qatar, he already impressed us all, but you kind of like, and I think for me, it's still that early start. I know everyone's gone on social media, and you know, Brad and them are, are useless now. I, I can't believe some of the stuff I've been on social media, but it, it's it's amazing how huh? one race weekend. But anyway, Pedro has proved himself a talent. You cannot deny it. The way he rode that motorcycle this weekend, Sheridan said he watched on the side of the track. The guy is just such. A clever rider. He breaks. He keeps the bike upright. He doesn't carry too much lean angle. He, he's, he, he, his, his lines are right. He got the perfect bike setup. He's just doing everything right, especially for Portimao, a track that he loves. Great. What impressed me again with Pedro Costa, and I mentioned at Qatar, is that he's doing this and he's finishing third on the podium. 
in the fastest MotoGP championship there's ever been. So he's not coming into a MotoGP championship with old riders that are on their last legs, and he is coming to the prime best MotoGP championship there has ever been. And in his second race, he finished on the podium. Yes, in a way, was a gift to it to him with the Vinales. Yes, but you make your own luck sometimes, and he put himself around the mix. Things that stood out to me in that race, and I'm talking specifically in the in the Sunday races. The commentators were saying it as well. Simon Crayfall was saying it often, quite often. And he's saying, you know, you can't ride. We all know. Everyone said it. You can't ride close to people. Your front tire overheats. Pedro Acosta's front tire doesn't overheat. He was just riding right on. You know, so all those, all those myths or all those, you know, those things you just don't do, he was doing. He goes into turn one, slides the thing once, twice, yeah. three times on the inside of Banyaya, stops it. Okay, Banyaya passes him back. He he was fantastic. He was pure entertainment on Sunday. And you, you, don't bring Brad. And I know Brad and them have to come into the conversation a little bit because it's KTM. And, 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 and. The Pedro Acosta conversation is a great one. And I look at it and I answered a comment on Facebook about it. I think it's brilliant for KTM. I think it's brilliant for Brad. I think it's brilliant for Jack. Last year, Jack coming into that KTM and saying to KTM and Brad, Yo, you can use a soft tire. Yes, you can do this sparked Brad and we saw a reaction from Brad and we saw the whole KTM package go like this. The same is going to happen with Pedro Acosta there. Brad is no doubt and Jack and them and KTM are going to analyze what, what Pedro did, look at it, you know, you, you're only going to get better if you're being beaten or if you're being put in these situations. So Brad, cool, hands up, wasn't our weekend, but what can we learn from Pedro and what he did and what that gas gas did? And that's the way we got to look at it. It's not the end of Brad Binder's career or Jack Miller's career and Pedro's going to win the championship. But if he does, hats off to him. I still think there's going to be a couple of rookie mistakes in there. I'm going to, I think there's going to be a couple of wild passes that he gets wrong. I think there's still one or two of those learning curves and there might be one or two tracks that he goes to and he's not as successful. Portimao, you know, favors his riding style on that. But what you cannot take away from the young man is the performance, the confidence, the fact that he was passing multiple world champions, Mark Marquez, current world champions, Pekka Banyaya, not with no respect, but he wasn't sitting there going, oh no, geez, I'm just a rookie. I've got... Bang, bang, bang. And he did it with class, with entertainment, with using his head, with racecraft. It was it was just fantastic, fantastic to watch. And the fact that he just dispelled all these myths. You can't ride close. Your front tire is going to overheat. He had, he had none of those problems. Yeah, Rob, absolutely. There's so many points you mentioned there that are triggering triggering things in my brain. The first thing I want to mention, which is way left field Yeah, Remember when we were discussing Furman Aldegaya last year, no one had signed for Repsol Honda. I said, yes, I'd like to see Honda take this guy because they have no preconceived ideas about how to ride the bike. Get on it, go as fast as you can go. Okay, Honda didn't do that. I think they missed a trick there, personal opinion. But what have KTM done with Pedro Costa? Gas, gas, call it what you want. They've taken a rider with, I'm not going to say low expectations, no expectations. Sure, Brad, Jack, Danny Pedrosa, Paul Espargaro would have said to him, you can't do this, you can't do that, try this. He said, forget it, guys. I'm going to ride this bike, fly by the seat of my pants, and it's clearly worked for him. So he's taken that idea that, or, or he hasn't got the idea that, oh, I can't draft for three laps because my front tire is going to overheat. Well, he clearly says, well, I'll draft you for two laps. Now I've seen where you're slower than me or where I can bomb you. I'll bomb you. I don't care if your name's Mark Marquez, Peko Bagnaya. I'm faster than you in turn X. I'll pass you here. And if you can get back on me, well, good luck to you. I mean, look at him through turn one passing Peko. A lesser rider would have done it. There is no doubt that bike was out of shape. And as you say, Rob, three times. So obviously mm -hmm. what he did, he grabbed the brakes. It got unsettled. He released the brake, grabbed the brake again. He's trying to control everything. His, his instinct is just on a different level. And there are very few people that ever have that. Rossi most certainly had it. Marquez has got it. Where they've got, you know, we've discussed it. Is it that little bit of extra feel that they just know that point where they need to let the brake go or whatever it is? He certainly has it. And he mm -hmm. just showed. And yes, so he beat Brad going to up Brad's game. I, we knew it would happen, I thought, maybe once or twice the whole yeah, year. Yeah. But what yeah, he's also yeah. done, he said to Brad, look what this bike can do. I mean, to me, out of the last turn onto the start-finish straight, 
he must have been half a second faster than anyone there because he made up so much time getting onto that back straight. Now they'll analyze that data and say, well, what was he doing? What was the setup on his bike? So like you say, to have him doing that now, they've already moved the goalpost one inch forward. And to me, that's fantastic. But listen, this boy is talented. Eh? Absolutely. You know, whether you like him or not, and I know there's a kind of an anti-Spanish sentiment, uh -huh. and, and rightfully so. If you looked at qualifying, I think it was, there were five Spaniards in a row. Mm -hmm. Don't blame them. They're doing something right. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, he's got no equipment advantage over Brad Binder, Jack Miller, and look what he did. He is, no, without a doubt, this is a special talent. Um, and, and KTM have done the best thing by signing him. And it's going to benefit their whole team. There's absolutely no doubt. So I, I just hope it doesn't take focus away from Brad, which I don't think it will, because without a doubt, he didn't have his greatest weekend. He salvaged some points thanks to some other people. But that's racing. As you say, Rob, you've got to take the good with the bad. Mistake on Saturday, and we discussed it after Qatar. We said if Brad doesn't crash, because last year he had four race crashes, he's got to just, and I don't know what the reason was. He lost the front, whatever it was. We saw in Valencia they were having such problems with tyres, but I haven't read a debrief from Brad regarding Saturday. But yeah, um, this Pedro Costa is going to move their whole team. I won't say in a different direction, but certainly it's going to move the team forward. There's no doubt. Yeah, so Brad's Brad's thoughts on, on Saturday was he just reading his debrief and listening to his debrief that was sent to me is he just had a tire that just felt like a piece of wood from, from the word go and he, he just didn't look happy. Listening to, to Shez's debriefs, he was very close with Brad the whole weekend, um, you know, obviously being top competitive racers and Brad's always kind of looked up to Shez in many ways. Shez paved the way for a lot of South Africans to go. So they've always, you know, Brad's always had this massive amount of respect for Sheridan and uh, was. Sheridan was was Brad's guest there over the weekend, even though Shez fought like hell not to be there because I know Shez, you know, he doesn't like to be in these kind of situations because it's it's hard for him. He wanted to be there. He wants to be there. And, you know, the reality is he's not and he hasn't been there. So it, it hurts for a guy with so much pride in that like Shez. But I'm, I'm glad I asked him how it went and he actually really enjoyed himself. So it was great having Shez there. And I did ask him to send me notes on Brad, you know what? And he just said, you know, from what he saw, Brad and them, reached a brick wall quite early on in, in the race weekend. They found a setup that they went quite fast with. Brad was good on Friday and good on Saturday and then hit a brick wall where the others improved that KTM hit a hit a brick wall and they just couldn't find a solution to it. And I'm not talking Brad and Jack specifically. Um, you know, not so much Pedro. We know what happened there. They found a solution and he went faster and he went better. Um, track side, Shares just said it, it was visible. You could see the biggest strength of the KTM, if, and if you watch last season compared to this season, is the way it can back in, slide its way into the corner, and then you know it's like one beautiful motion into a corner. And and Shares said it was missing this weekend. You, you would see Brad kind of like slide, and then the bike would chop itself and load the front, and then Brad was complaining of corner entry and mid corner. He couldn't carry the speed because now the front's overloaded. They just couldn't get the seamless transition from rear to front that they they normally have whether that's the new rear wings but it's set up because Pedro Acosta got it right it's set up or riding style because Pedro was obviously doing something right and Brad and Jack were doing something wrong but but the big note that Shez noticed and he and he said it was so noticeable was that there was just this the box where he, and he uses the word chop you would he just said it chopped it chopped its way into the corner the Ducati kind of goes sideways settles itself and takes you into the corner. Uh, Pedro Costa, we saw him sliding it, but slide itself into the corner with Pedro. And with Brad and Jack, and, and I watched it uh, a bit more of the highlights than that after I got the, the, the voice note from Shez. And I watched it, and you see, especially the onboards with Pedro when he's following Brad, you know, you can see that rear kind of slide, correct itself, but then chop itself and push. And there was a bit more pumping from the rear tire on Brad. So it was a weekend where they just couldn't find a solution to the problem. It, it wasn't a weekend where now Pedro's completely outshone Brad and Brad is now over. He must retire as a MotoGP racer. It wasn't a case of that. It was a case of, right, we didn't have it this weekend. And Brad said in his debriefs, we just went on the pace. Lucky to come out with fourth. Again, you make your own luck. He realized he didn't have the pace, did the right thing by going, and it must have been so hard. Can you imagine how hard it must have been for Brad there when Pedro Acosta overtakes you on the same bike, the rookie, everyone's talking about him. You're supposed to be this championship contender. You finished second at Qatar. 
This guy passes you and you just don't have the pace to go with him. No matter what you do, you just don't have the feel or the pace to go with him. And to make that decision to go, I have to accept that for now. I have to accept it. It kills these guys, all of these riders. It's the worst thing in the world for them to do. Hence why the Pico and Marquez incident happened. It's the worst thing for them to do. But Brad did it. What happened? He finished fourth on Sunday after a miserable Saturday. You know, and if you're going to lose points, do it in the sprint race. Sunday's when it counts. Made it count. Comes out of the weekend where all the talks about Pedro and this and this and this. Brad Binder second in the World Championship. Second, yeah. Yeah. So these are the kind of things you got to pull apart. Yes, I know we all want Brad beating all the guys week in, week out. Week in. The fact is it's not going to happen. And I think you touched upon it a, a couple of comments ago. We kind of named our top five that are going to be week in. It's actually an open playing field with these guys. You know, yeah, there's the, the scragglers that need to find something. But I watched this weekend again, and, and we'll talk about Vignoles just now. But Vignoles impressed me out of nowhere. You know, this guy that was literally... Yeah shitting himself the whole day was probably apart from Pedro Acosta to me one of the best riders of the weekend you know so people the overreaction on Facebook and social media has just got to stop it is a long season there is plenty for Brad to get right Brad to get wrong Pedro to get right Pedro to get wrong Pico Banyaya two-time world champion in a row makes mistakes Mark Marquez eight-time world champ makes mistakes Jorge Martin they all make mistakes but you can't take away the fact that Pedro was impressive. And unfortunately, Brad and KTM and Jack Miller just didn't have that setup. And they've got to now find it, whether that's picking apart Pedro's data or their data. But they've got that information now, which is the beautiful thing. It's not just Brad and Jack switching notes while Paul and Augusta are a bit further back and they're the ones picking their notes. Now Brad and Jack are picking someone foster them then, though. It's, it's got to help the project. Yeah, definitely. And, and if you listen to... Pedro Costa's interview, he said, I'd like to thank Pit Barra and the KTM team. Mm -hmm. So clearly we know the synergy is there, which was something that I wanted to have a confirmation of. We know eight Ducatis share eight Ducatis worth of info. Yes, some of them are 23 models, some are 24, but they know exactly what they can share and what they need to only look at one bike. But with Pedro Costa saying that in his interview after the race, that says to me, that as much as we've got a KTM factory team and gas gas, it's one team. It's managed by the same person. It's overseen by the same person. So I think the synergy will be there. And most certainly what you said about watching Pedro Acosta's style versus Brad on this weekend. They're going to look at what Pedro's setup was and what he was doing. And maybe that's something for Brad to try when he finds himself in the same circumstance. We might find in three weekends time in Cota, Brad gets there, everything's working, and he's half a second quicker than Pedro. Then Pedro's going to go to Brad's side of the garage and say, what do we do? So it swings and roundabouts. To even think of writing Brad Binder off now, oh, man, don't even – I can't believe people think like that. But I understand people watch this with emotion. We, we all do. We want to say, oh, my favorite's going to be world champion, then he falls off. Your head – has to come into it at some point and say, okay, like we did, we analyzed the crash. We analyzed what Pedro Acosta did right this weekend because that's all we can do. We can't worry about what's going to happen next week. We don't know. So I think that's, you know, we've all got it. This is a most certainly a passion-driven sport. Mm -hmm. But sometimes just take a step back and we all want our guy to do well. Mm -hmm. As you said, Robert, he's so competitive. It's not going to happen. Gone are the days of a McDuan winning 15 races in a row. I mean, Mark did it in 2016, if I remember correctly, won 10 in a row. I don't think anyone's done four in a row since then. You know, so the goalpost, once again, the, the sport has got so close. We see it in lap times. You know, when you think of qualifying, 14 riders within one second. You know, take your stopwatch on your wrist and try to press the button on and off in one second. 14 bikes have gone past you. That's how competitive it is. So, you know, the margins we're talking about when Brad has a bad day and Salvage is a fourth and he's still second in the points. You know, we're talking, yes, I hate to say, but it's ball is that we're splitting here. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's going to be like. And what has happened earlier than I expected, we've thrown Pedro Acosta into the mix because he's had two great weekends. There's no chance that suddenly he's going to get slower. Yes, he's going to have tracks where he's going to struggle, no doubt. 
Okay, put him in the mix, boy, and do not write him off at this moment or or underestimate how good he is. I still don't think he'll win the championship, but most certainly, if we've got 18 races left, he's going to be competitive at the front end in 10 of them. There's no doubt about that. The scary thing with Pedro Acosta is it's reality. He's only going to get better. That's no. And I think that's what we're all scared about as Brad Binder fans cap on. Right, Brad Binder fan cap off. Little big media co and Oli Moto having a little bit of a back and forth here on the side. And I don't want it to get nasty because it's an open conversation. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. So I understand what little big media co is saying about Brad and he won his, his third race as a rookie. You know, coming to Brad's defense, Oli Moto kind of going by the facts and the stats, which you cannot ignore. And unfortunately, Brad's going to have this monkey on his back until those stats improve. And I'm talking race win stats championship overall stats there's always going to be this argument that well is binder really a title contender we say it we believe it the stats on there yes he finished fourth last year but not one race win overall race win. not i'm not counting sprint saturdays yeah. qualifying a little up and down you know it, it, not just brad binder you gotta throw ktm into it so it's not just the brad binder problem and i think that's the difference here we go brad binder it's a brad binder and a ktm mixer so i can understand the discussion on both sides at Little Big Media Co. and Oli Moto are saying here. But the problem is, and I've had it with people, when I go to the track or when I speak to some of my British mates here now and then, and I bring up Brad Binder and they go, how many races did he win last year? And you can't, you you, you know, I get up front and I say, well, <laughs> until those stats improve, Brad Binder is going to have this monkey on his back and Brad Binder is going to have the... You, you, people are going to have the ammunition to go, what are the stats? R read the stats. And that is what is Brad's biggest handbrake at the moment. Uh, so he, he's he's got to break that, that, that wind duck, which I think is holding him back as well and frustrating the hell out of him, trust me. But it has to. It, it, it has to break itself. And then the Brad Binder conversation, I think, will be more more open and more relevant to, compared to what it is now. Because at the moment, like you said, it's passionate Brad Binder fans going, blah, 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 blah. And it's the statistic, statisticians, statisticians, however you say that. The, the guy's looking at all the numbers going, it does, and it doesn't lie. You know, Oli Moto, as much as I want to climb through my computer screen and maybe headbutt you, you're, you're absolutely right. You, yeah. you can't ignore the stats. So anyway, there was problems for Brad Binder and they, they couldn't get the bike set up the way they wanted to. Brad and Jack, they, were, they, were, they weren't at the races really this weekend, but they came out in the best possible situation, second in the World Championship. Brilliant there. Um, moving a little bit further down, a lot of riders benefited on, on Sunday with the crashes of Vinales, Marquez and Benyaya. So these results are a little bit sugar-coated. Brad's fourth place was a little bit sugar-coated. Um, further down, Jack Miller's fifth place was a little bit sugar-coated. Sugar Marco Bedzeki finished sixth, which on paper, looking at the result, great. Not great. Uh, the weekend, again, just th that VR46 Mooney or whatever it's called, Pertamina team now, it's just going under the radar. They've got the brightest bike on the grid and it looks fantastic, but they, they're they just not even being spoken about. Bedzeki was, again, I had to like, slap my door. Where's Bedzeki? And I had to look for him on the sheet. So under the radar, again, something's not clicking there just yet with Bedzeki and the new big bike that he's been updated to for this year i think it will come we saw these growing pains with peko and martin when they jumped on this new spec to caddy with a front end feeling in that i think it's still coming from bedzeki but you're two rounds in you're not showing the same kind of competitive nature that you did last year you know and motor gp waits for no one so yeah, DJ Antonio was very disappointing this weekend compared to Qatar. I think DJ is that kind of rider. We've spoken about it. He's going to just do this. He's, he's going to do this. He's, he's going to shine some weekends. He's going to be mid-pack some weekends, and he's going to have terrible weekends. He's just – there's no grid fillers these days, but there is, if you know what I mean. There's yeah. not grid fillers like in the old day where you paid your money, you had the scrappiest old bike and got lapped five times. Not those grid fillers. There's, he's good enough to be in MotoGP. He's proven it with wins and that. He's just not that alien status that the rest of them are. But Bedzeki, I was, again, curious. 19 seconds off the win in six. Again, made the best of a bad situation and a bad weekend, but not quite there yet. Yeah, and actually nowhere in qualifying, nowhere in the sprint. Mm -hmm. In all fairness, running in ninth place, 
you know, yeah. so, same with Brad. Brad was actually in seventh mm -hmm. place. But that's racing, you know. It only counts when you cross the checkered line at the end of the race. So, yes, he finished in a sixth position. Mm -hmm. I'm also very disappointed. My head is now starting to think, is his head thinking, I sacrificed a Pramac ride to ride this bike. Mm -hmm. And the Pramac bike is leading the world championship. And last year, I wasn't a whole hell of a lot of a way behind George Martin in the in, in any of the racing. Yeah, I'm, the odd race is four or five seconds behind. But now he's, he's a second a lap off the pace. Not quite. It's about eight tenths of a second per lap. I don't know what's going on with him. You know, he's got no, he just doesn't seem to have any, I don't know, when they, the little bit they do show of him, whether it's in the pits or, you know, he just seems to be there. Mm. Um, whether he is struggling badly, maybe he's struggling and he's looking at a Mark Marquez new on the bike and consistently faster than him, which should never be happening. Mm. Because he's had three years on the Ducati, he should be accustomed to it. I don't know. He's definitely been the disappointment of the season so far to me. For someone who was third in the championship, I really thought, well, this guy, you know, he, we're going to throw him in the mix. He's going to be one of the four Ducatis racing for this title week in and week out. And so far, he hasn't scared anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's what I worry about him. And um, same can be said for Alex Marquez a little bit later. Well, we'll just touch upon him as well. That my fear of him being overshadowed by his brother, Mark's come into that team on the Ducati, still fresh to it, and he's already beating Alex. This weekend, Alex, compared to last last year, where he had a much better outing, I just worry about Alex Marquez being overshadowed. And I know people said, yeah, but it should improve him. I think Alex Marquez is, is fragile like that. And I, I and I can already, it's still early in the season. Listen, we're talking two races in, and this is what we have wow. to remember with all these comments that we're making. Yeah, but you yeah. can just see those those signs of, of, you know, Alex Marquez. Can he deal with the fact that his brother's faster than him? better than him on the same bike, less time on it. You know, those are the kind of factors he's got to deal with. So, you know, I put Alex Marquez, Bedzeki, and those kind of guys in that same kind of pool of, right, now it's here. We know the talent that you've got. Now it's time to start showing this. And that's where they've got to do it. Um, Fabio Quattararo in seventh. Again, I know I, I got the Yamaha press release and they were like, um, you know, hard work paying off and no Yamaha. Don't don't yeah. don't get above yourselves. It was a good weekend. They, they showed signs in the free practice sessions in qualifying with there. I was impressed with Rins that he was matching Quattararo's um, times and race pace in in some areas, which is a good sign because he's also very fresh to the project, still carrying that injury. So that's really good for them. I think he's going to be the one taking that Yamaha project forward as opposed to Quattararo, who just goes into every weekend now just riding it and okay, whatever Alex is doing, put it in my bike and I just want to ride, get this over with. I'm going to Aprilia, but. Again, 20 seconds off the win in seventh, and I get a press release saying, you know, the hard work's paying off. Don't, don't kid yourselves, Yamaha. You're still a long way off. But, again, you do have to look at the stats, and the stats are that he finished seventh, and 20 seconds, you know, is it a lot now for Yamaha compared to where Honda are? Not too bad, but still. that I mean, the Yamaha and Honda conversation is is a very is a very big one and long one to have. I think what Yamaha can say is they are the top Japanese manufacturer because they're certainly m big steps ahead of Honda at the moment. And, I mean, they're running two bikes, so they've got half the amount of data that Honda are collecting, and they're doing a better job. There's absolutely no doubt. I, you know, I was blown away to look uh, at the end of qualifying, and the last four bikes on the grid were the four Hondas. Mm -hmm. You know, often they're the last two. But generally, you'll have one in sort of a 12th or 13th. If Mark's not there, they don't make it into Q2. But then you would have had a 13th, 14th, 5th. Yeah, the last four bikes were Hondas. And exactly what Shez said in his voice note to you, he said, if you look at Marini, he was running at the back like a, well, what did he call him? A track day rider. You know, mm -hmm. we in cycling, we'd call him a fun rider. You know, he's there to, I don't even want to say to make up the numbers. He's the worst of the Hondas. You know, so I don't know. Has his head already fallen out of the project? Um, I, Rob, I don't know. But I just want to go back to Bezeki and Alex Marquez. You've said it all along. Grid fillers is a great word, and we're not disrespecting anyone there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would have put, put Bezeki two leagues ahead of Alex, albeit that Alex is a two-times world champion. Mm -hmm. I still would have put Bezeki ahead of him. But neither of them are 
shine in the light anywhere. And I think you're quite right with Alex. And I don't think he expected anything less than to get drilled by his boot, but it's happening. And last year, he was the bigger fish in the smaller team. Now he's the small fish in the small team, and it's definitely it's showing. So, yeah, I agree exactly what you're saying there. But I really was expecting way more from Bezeki. And as we say, two races in. But, you know, it's a bit of a trend. You know, he didn't have a great weekend in Qatar. He didn't have a great weekend this weekend. So, yeah, let's see where it goes. As for Quattarara, I think he put in a big effort. I really do. He looked better. The fact, as you say, 20 seconds off in a 22-lap race, you're not even close. So, you know, their press release saying how much they've improved, I, I personally found looking at the way he was, he looked better. But could that be because he signed a contract with Aprilia? Now that weight is gone and he knows he's got something to look forward to. Because me personally, when he said it, I think it was during last week, he said the announcement will be made soon. I thought he was going to announce it this weekend. I really did. I thought after Friday qualifying, we were going to have a press announcement, and here he is on an Aprilia. I, I think it's imminent. Um, but yeah, let's. But to me, he just looked better. And I agree with you. Rins just seems to be the guy that just give him a bike and he'll ride it. Didn't matter when he was on the LCR Honda last year, the Suzuki before that. Yeah, he was good on the Suzuki. But anyway, he seems to be a guy that just give me a bike and I'm going to do the best that I can do and I'll enjoy it because he always looks like he's enjoying it even with a limp and a walking cane and everything else going on. So I'm very happy for them. I, th I do think it was an improvement, mm. but it's not an improvement that's going to get them anywhere near the front. So there's a big difference. Easy to say, yeah, we made great strides. But like you and I say, Rob, 20 seconds, thats you're not even in the ballpark. Absolutely. Talk staying with the Aprilia kind of banner. We touched upon Maverick Vinales. I was impressed with Maverick. There was a whole different demeanor about Maverick. I think what benefited him the most was a good qualifying and good starts you know maverick's done this before if he doesn't get a start he doesn't know how to recover from it when yeah. something happens to maverick he can't recover this weekend good start he fought like hell i mean they, they, they spoke about him losing two and a half kilos over the weekend with the, the bug that he had he looks thinner leaner meaner foster he just looked like the vinales that we that aprilia paid big money to that yamaha that we're all hyped up about and I was really impressed with Maverick. As I said, uh, apart from Pedro and possibly, obviously, Martin, because he won the race weekend, Mar Vinales takes the ride of the weekend for me, purely because on top of that, there was no other Aprilia even close to him. So he really took hold of that, I am the number one rider. He took hold of it and he embraced it. And that's what I want to see. And that's what we need to see more from Vinales. Pretty about the, the incident that happened on the Sunday with the gearbox um, going but Are I think you buying that story, Rob? I, I'm not buying it, no. I, I'm okay. not buying it at all. I think the engine either croaked itself to death or they ran out of fuel. Um, you don't just think he thought it was the end because watch when he takes his foot off the line, it's uh, off the peg. It's exactly when he gets to the line, uh, in line with where his team is standing. I, I think... I'm think, still convinced he, he, he went one lap to... No, I, was the I, end think, I think... I mean, he came, he came in the camera's at the end and he's going like this, like the gearbox or something's gone. Yeah. He's saying it jumped into gear and it locked up and threw him, which I can see. I, I personally think the engine just croaked and from a PR point of view, you know, because you allocated engines and whatever, whatever, I think they said, listen, don't say it's the engine, just say it's the gearbox. I think he put his leg out to, as he says, to warn the riders because he thought they were a lot closer. I don't think he celebrated early, but again, that's, you could actually pull that apart whichever way you want it. Yeah. Either way, uh, yeah, I was impressed with Maverick, but we need that Maverick to come out more. Alicia Spargo, disappointing again in eighth place, 21 seconds off the pace. Alicia is going to be that up and down yo-yo rider this year. I think Miguel Oliveira, I know we've got a lot of Portuguese fans listening, uh, lapping it up in ninth place, taking the accolade. And I know at the moment he's just pulling confidence from that. Same with Quattararo in many ways. You take whatever confidence you can get, even though the bigger picture is not as bright as it seems. You take the confidence. You know, Miguel is quickly becoming one of those riders you forget about for me that you go, oh, Jesus, yeah, okay. Actually, the track house team's there. Jeez, you have to give him a little bit of airtime. And in yeah, front of his home yeah. fans at a track that he's won on a, you know, satellite KTM before, I worry, I probably need this injection of either Bastianini, Quattro, they, they need this now. They need to break this mold. Um, you know, Aleish must go to a test role, ambassador role, whatever. Maverick, if he continues this, he can certainly be one of the, the, the riders in the factory team, but needs to prove it uh, on more consistently. So, yeah, 
Prilio just need that next step now. I think that maybe hit a brick wall with Aleish, especially if he's doing all the developing, which he is. I don't think you can pull much from Raul and Miguel, as I've said before, and certainly Maverick, although Maverick made a big... As I said, the biggest thing I saw from Maverick this weekend was he took that, I'm the team leader, I'm the captain. I'm the captain. He took it this weekend and he went with it. And that's what Aprilia need to see more for that project and the Maverick Vinales project to go to the next level. Yeah, I agree. I think he was feeding off that ego that he's the main guy because Aleish was so far behind him. But every other weekend or most other weekends, the role is reversed. So Aleish is getting all the limelight, the TV coverage, the engineers hovering around his every word. Where this weekend, it seemed to work in reverse. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's the issue with Maverick. And we've discussed it many times that what's in his head. I've mentioned it with versus Luca Cadillora from years ago. When he's on it, you don't beat the guy. Mm -hmm. So is it a case of they need to detract a little bit from Elish at the beginning of the race weekend and concentrate, boost his ego, blow smoke up his butthole if that's what it's going to take. Because as you're saying, Rob, when you see this guy and he's on it, he's on it properly. Eh? He really was good. And normally he does a bit of a Jack Miller. And on that point, Jack impressed me this weekend. Those words are coming out of my mouth. Um, but I think normally you see Maverick, if he does have a reasonable start, he steadily works himself back into the bottom end of the top 10, early into the teens. This weekend, he just looked like a different guy. And as you say, no other Aprilia anyway. So it's anywhere. So it's not like they can say, okay, we've all got the bikes right and check how we are. It was him versus Ducati and KTM or Gas Gas. And I, I was super impressed with him. Also, according to them, he had a bit of diarrhea. You know what that's like? That just drains you and mentally as well. But I think really great weekend for him. But I still think in my mind, he thought he had crossed the line in second place. But uh, that's irrelevant now because he it was a turn of bad luck, whatever it was. But up until the last lap of the race, that was the Maverick Vinales we want to see because it just shows how talented he actually is. Uh, yeah, I think you've summed it up perfectly there and pretty much the same sentiments everyone has down the side there. Oli Mota and I keep bringing him up because he, he brings in good comments and talking about Oliveira as an enigma, saying, you know, he's 29 years old. What does he bring to the party? I know he brings sponsor money and stuff. It's a big year for, and I said it, we said it in preseason testing. There's some riders with big targets on their back. Maverick Vinales was one, comes with a big paycheck, got to start producing results. Oliveira is another one of those riders, especially with an American-run team saying, you know, we want a Joe Roberts who finished on the podium at Portimao and Moto2. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so there's there's a lot of question marks around MotoGP for 2025, which makes it exciting. If we if we were sitting here just talking about the racing and everyone was signed for next year, the, the conversation is not as exciting. But um, it is. It's it's big. I mean, the, the, the big the big things you could take out of this weekend, as, as we spoke about, Martin, a serious title contender. There's a more serious title contender. Pedro Costa, supreme talent, going to elevate everything, going to upset the apple cart quite a few times this year, no doubt about that. Mark Marquez, only going to get better on the Ducati. Honda, dismal. You know, Luke, talking about Luca Marini, 40.7 seconds off the win. Now, I said it, the only asset that I could see Marini bring into Honda is that he's meticulous and the fact that he's not going to throw the bike in the scenery when it's not right. So that's the only thing Honda have got going for them at the moment is the guys doing laps, bringing the bike home in one piece with data. Okay, the fact that he's finishing stone last is not helping, but he's got that, I don't want to say mature, maturity, that patience to say, I'm not feeling this. I don't care what people, you know, I, I do care what people say, but I'm not feeling this. I'm going to finish stone last, but I'm going to bring the bike home and data. I'm going to analyze that data and I'm going to, you know, I don't think he's in a, a rush. You know, Mark Marquez was in a rush. If I'm not going to win, I'm going to crash. And you must fix the bike and we'll try again. Luca Marini is going, I've got a two-year deal. As I said, Marini is never going to blow my socks off, to, to be honest. Um, so, Rob, what's the better option? You've got a Mark Marquez who's going to do or die. He's going to do his very best to get the absolute best result on a bike that's not competitive. And he's going to crash and get no points. But he's... He's, he's showing you there's a little bit of potential. Well, you've got a guy like Marini riding around in last place. He doesn't get you any airtime. He doesn't get you... Yeah, yeah. so he's getting you data, but he's 40 seconds behind. You know, I'm questioning it because a lot of people had a lot to say about Mark 
setting the world record of crashes last year. But every single lap of every race that he finished or started, you wanted to see what he was going to do. When was he going to crash or who was he going to pass? When Marini, you know, and I'm not disrespecting the guy in any way, I agree with you, he's never going to win a world championship. But in fact, you can say it about all the Honda guys. Mir seems to be a little bit better. He's not crashing as much as he did last year. But why? Is he slowing down? Is the bike just that rubbish that they're not trying at all? And I'm not saying they're not, but, you know, the best Honda was 30 seconds off the pace. That's 10 seconds behind Quattararo, who we said, yeah, that was cut. Yeah. You know, 10 seconds behind him. You know, we, I don't know. It's, it's a problem. Eh? It's, it's, you know, it's very disappointing. I think I think the biggest problem for them is, um, you know, Marquez obviously sold T-shirts and caps. The, the problem they've got is they're losing Repsol throughout this all. Yeah. That Honda, that Honda flavor is just being lost. I I go, you know, I'm going to the Silverstone MotoGP weekend, and the first thing I think is how much money have I got to buy caps? Because I like to, I have no desire to buy a, a Repsol Honda Marini cap or a John Muir. You know, so they've lost that 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 flavor. They've lost that yeah. attention. Yeah. They're the background. They, again, they just there's there's no reason to focus on them other than the fact that you point fingers and say you're not doing well, you're not doing well. So Honda, Honda have got a big problem. You know, Monster Energy Yamaha have still got the pull of its Quattarari. He was champion just a couple of years ago. He kind of sells shirts and helmets and rins in a way is always going. You've got Marini and Mia who aren't crowd pullers. And I had an argument with someone on YouTube with regards to Mia kind of telling me that I was an idiot and how can I write Mia off? Look what he's done and this. And... What's he done? Again, it's one of those things where you go, okay, well, okay, yeah, he's a world champion, but he's won one race. Since then, since the Suzuki glory days where everyone else kind of faltered and gave him the championship, really what happened? And he was just the most consistent with the tires and everything. What has the guy done? You know, and so it's, it's a big conversation, one that we can go on for days. Unfortunately, we have to, I have to leave it there because I've got to go shout at some British guys swearing at me and, and let me let me tell you a little story so I, I i was refing a couple of weeks ago and i'm very strict you know these footballers you get touched you fall over you cry ref 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 and i just let the game play so anyway the one guy comes up to me and says ref i know what the problem is your kind like rugby <laughs> your kind. <laughs> my kind so let me tell you about my kind you wouldn't survive two seconds from where my kind comes from, you know? And then I kind of like rambled out, you know, the, the load shedding, the water, the crime and everything. Oh, and since then, this was about three weeks ago. Since then, when I blow that whistle, it's. <gasps> <laughs> so yeah, my our, our kind, but anyway, I enjoy the riffing as much as I complain about it. I have power. I have this whistle that I can just blow and tell them to do what they want to do. So Paul, Yep. Before you go, one question I want to ask that we need to, I don't know if some of our guys with the comments can maybe help us out. I've got a mate, his name's Kevin. Every week he says to me, Paul, please speak to someone or find out how the aerodynamics on the front of the Ducati fairing, it bulges at the bottom. What impact does that play? And I said, no, it's to dissipate all the heat. And he said, no, it's changed from last year to this year. Who can we speak to? So I said, okay, I'll ask you. Maybe yeah. someone on the show knows, or I don't know. Who do we do? Who do we yeah. speak to? How do we get hold that, of that, that, that's, that's definitely a Simon Crayfar question or someone else. Um, yeah. I definitely that's need to delve into more personalities in the paddock that I can pull into these discussions, whether it be crew or Maybe when you are at Silverstone, there'll be yeah. someone who can explain the intricacies to us. That's a very good That's a very good thing. My, my job for Silverstone will be to go in and, and ask those kind of questions yeah. that, that the guys that don't get asked those questions. One, to, to end off on, on that kind of topic is one comment I heard Simon Crayfall made that Mark Marquez made is that the Honda performed better when they followed. That's why they had to follow. The front end worked better and that which to a person like Simon Crayfall, who doesn't also fully understand aero, tells you that the Honda aero is not working because it works better when it's in a slipstream. Whereas Mark has said it's the opposite on the Ducati. If you're too close to someone, it offsets the bike, which means it works better without better. air being disrupted in front of you type thing. So yeah. it's a very it's a very intriguing question and definitely one that we, we need to pull apart because um, – Neil Spaulding, Olimoto, you know what? Neil is that I friended him on Facebook about a year ago. So I had these big ideas. 
Neil Spalding, for those who don't know, he's an author. He writes a book, but he's like the technical side. He's a technical guru of MotoGP and Olimoto, brilliant. Neil Spalding, I'm going to write it down because I'm 42 years old now. If I don't write things down, um, yeah, Neil Spalding, he will be the man that we need to get. So uh, leave that with me, Paul yes. and everyone. Uh, we will definitely dive into that. And uh, Paulie, thank you again. Always just fantastic. I just get so... You know, this conversation just excites me even more about MotoGPs when it's with us Absolutely. and everyone. I, I know Oli Moto and Little Big Media Co. You had your little thing, but that—that's what it's about. It's it, everyone has their voice here. It's keeping it neat and tidy, which, in a way, you did. You did. You both did go Pecco and Mark on us. I think a little bit there, but um, it's fine. It's as you said. It's it's passion. We we you know we we're, we're passionate about this. We sometimes let this do more of the talking than this. Um, but brilliant comments all on the side. I wish we could literally just have a five-hour show and I'd go to every single comment because, Paul, I can tell you the whole comment, you don't see it. The whole comment section here is amplified versions of me and you. They've all got brilliant points, valid points. So I love the discussion. I wish we could do it for longer and more. And, and Rob, just on that point, I'm interrupting you, but have you seen or heard how many times the commentators discuss what we've already spoken about? Yeah, look, so I like to highlight that because some people might think that we like we guess a lot of this stuff, but you know we we passionate we study it and you know you pick up a lot and they just repeat. I think they listen to our podcast on absolutely. well now they're going to listen tomorrow night and then they say hey we must remember to mention that. I really I, it's almost like that, eh? Yeah, but I, I think it's the way you 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 see it. You know, it's you've been in it a long time. You've commentated it. You follow it closely, and when you follow it that closely things are a lot more clear cut when you're yeah. following it closely. And I saw that when I went to that MotoGP a couple of years ago, when I was with Darren and I, I went to those 13 rounds and you, I saw MotoGP in a completely different picture. Uh, you know, I looked at the riders differently. I, lo I looked at the way the teams do things. There's so much to take in with MotoGP. And I, you know, that's, that's the hook that grabs us every time is that, you know, we only know a percent of it. We only know. A and that's what intrigued shares. There was a share saying, no, I don't want to go. And it, She's told me he had a great time. And it's because there's yeah. so much to take in. Yeah. She's yeah. posted pictures on his Instagram about the, the, the tanks being made. And, you know, Sven Grin is saying it. Yeah, he seconds that. When you go there, you know, and I wish I wish everyone could go to and experience MotoGP the way I do with that media pass. And you can see all those intricacies and ask these questions directly to the riders and stuff. It's a different world. And we just try and pull it apart as much as we can see. And... I do, you know, without blowing our heads up too much. Uh, we do. We do a fantastic job. And that's why we have so many people joining in. And that's why I'm saying a lot of the people on the side get it, get it, get it as well. They, um, The comments are great. The comments are great. Johnny Martin saying, let's do another show next week because it's a three-week break. Let's maybe do it because then there's not this pressure of trying to rush through it and we can have a bit more freedom of speech. So let me see what my work schedule is like. But yeah, let's maybe pull on another one out next week, Tuesday, because I don't think I've got anything Tuesday. Monday's a bank holiday, yeah, because Easter. So maybe Tuesday. Easter. But yeah, Donnie, great, great, great note there. Let's 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 do that. We'll have another open conversation about all these other things that we don't always get to when we're doing these race reviews. So um, Paulie, again, thank you so much. Everybody in the comments, thank you so, 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 so much. And until next week, Tuesday, look out for it. Yeah, let's let's talk some more MotoGP. Yeah, That's good all then, evening, everybody. everyone. Yep. Thanks, Rob. That was awesome. Go and wreck your soccer and don't let those oaks get the better of you. Eh? No, no, don't worry. I'm, I'm, I'm tough. I'm built on tough, so that, that'll never change. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Cheers.